So today we're going to talk about the data compiler and uh, I had scheduled to talk about resource loading too but I think the data compiler will take up quite a lot of time so I think we'll you just do that one today and it'll be enough. Um, so the data compiler as I said in the overview is responsible for taking our source data, JSON files, texture and so on and producing binary sources for a particular platform. Uh, there is also, that sounds simple enough, but there is also quite a lot of work done in order to make sure that it runs as fast as possible. And the most important thing in making the data compiler fast is to not compile more than we need to. So when a few files have changed, uh, we only want to compile uh, the files that have actually changed and the files that are dependent on that on those files and we're doing quite a lot of work to get the the turnaround time for data compiles down to sort of the the interactive range where where you don't even feel that you have to wait for a compile and of course if you if you have if you have a completely new project with all change resources, the compile will take a long time. But if you just modify a single resource, then the compile should be down to interactive times, which is like in the 100 millisecond range or range or something like that. So that we really want to be able to, to make uh, the compiles invisible for these small changes. Um, to run the compile, you have two options. You can run it standalone which is really useful for, for debugging. If you need to debug a compiled problem, you can run this from your, uh, from inside Visual Studio. Um, and you specify some arguments for the compile, like at the source, you specify compile to specify that you want to compile a source directory and a data directory uh, where it should end up. And you can also use a continue flag. That means that uh, after the compile is done, the engine should continue to run the project. You can only use that on Windows, of course, since Windows is the only platform that compiles. Uh, but if you, uh, that can be kind of useful to compile and run, uh, run the project. Uh, or you can run it in server mode where the engine boots up as a server and it accepts uh, compile requests over TCP IP. Uh, that basically contain the same data, like what directory we should compile from and what directory we should compile to. Uh, and the engine will then perform those, those compiles as a server. And that's usually what happens when you run the editor. Uh, the, engine, the engine boots up in, in the server mode and waits for, waits for a compile request from the editor. So a little overview of how the compile happens. The compile has quite many steps, so we'll try to go through all of them. Um, can be kind of hard to keep them all in your head at the same time, but we'll do our best. So the main uh, file that sort of initiate the highest level uh, where all the compiles get initiated from is in the file uh, called main data compiler, which is quite big, oh, sorry. which is quite big, unfortunately. Um, but here is here is what happens when we when we do a single compile from the command line. So this is not the server. The server code is very similar to this, except that it has a little has a little server loop that accepts messages and, and parses them. But this is what happens when we compile from the command line. Um, first, we set up um, the sort. We initiate the systems that we will need during this compile. We will need some error stuff, the profiler, thread pool, uh, allocators, all these, this is just like initializing all the different systems that we will use. Um, then we set up, set up the source for the compile. And the source for, for the compile is uh, one of these databases that I talked about uh, in the previous talk. Uh, which means that it it can represent part of the disk, but it also can also have mount points, so points that are uh, other part of the disk that we sort of virtually map into this uh, uh, this folder. Uh, 
so that we can map, for example, the core folder into the into the project folder. And these are all specified on the command line. Uh, when you do a command line compile, if you do it through the asset server, you specify them as arguments uh, to the WebSocket messages that you send to the asset server. Uh, but in this case, when it's on the command line, uh, we just parse the command line, parse out the arguments from there, and set up the mounted directories that we want. And then we create the create the database with the source directory and any additional mounts that the user wants. And that's the uh, that's the source uh, uh, source file system from this database that we will compile. And uh, then we yeah, there's some additional setup of allocators and threads here. Uh, we make a compile environment. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the compile environment later. Uh, but then uh, we just call the compile command and it will compile everything. And then it's just a matter of shutting everything down. Pop, 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 pop. In case of the server, when we run in server mode, we don't actually shut things down because we want to keep running and do more compiles. But since this is a one-off compile, we set everything up, compile and shut everything down. And mm, oh yeah. Uh, so each file that we compile, each of the resource types that we support has its own compiler. So this is a this is a compile function that's that we call in order to compile the data. And Mm, there's some more setup here. This is set up for, for the cache server where we can share compiler resources. Uh, set up a physics compiler, a bit more setup, more setup. And uh, this is registering compilers for the different entity compilers. We'll talk about that more when we get to the entity system. But this is sort of the most interesting part. This, this is the setup of the compilers for all the different types that we support. So for each type that we support, um, we specify the name of the type uh, and the current version of the binary resource. Uh, and this is used if we want to change the, the format, the format of our binary resources, we can just increase this version number and that will force a recompile of all those resources. So we don't have to worry that much about uh, the binary format, like the runtime format of resources. We can change that whenever we want. Uh, so we can make that more efficient, remove stuff that we don't need anymore and add stuff and so on. And we don't have to do any migration or, or anything complicated like that. We just increase this version number and it will force everything to be recompiled from the source format. Now if we want to change the source format, that's more complicated because then we'll We'll have to think about backwards compatibility and how do we migrate all data and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, which gets kind of messy. Uh, and that's also why we use JSON for the source format, since we can sort of extend that without destroying backwards compatibility by adding more keys. Uh, of course, we can't do that for all changes we want to make. So sometimes we have to do a migration step. But for the binary data, we don't need any migration or anything. We just bump the version number and we'll force uh, force a recompile of the data, which is really nice. And then we also specify the compile function for the data. You see some, some of these here specifies two names and that's because the, the one, the first there is the name of the, uh, so, or maybe it's the other way around, I don't remember. One of these is the name of the source extension on the source file and the other, the other is the type that the compiled resource will get. So these can be different, which is uh, usually you want to keep them the same, in which case you have specify one, one resource, but for historical reasons, some of these are have different names for the compiled resource uh, type and the and the type on uh, the type of the source resource. So this just sets up sets up all the all the different types that we know in the engine. And then we call out to the plugin manager, so the plugin, so our plugins can set up additional resource types if if they wanna uh, 
compile something. So after this, all this has been registered, uh, we can just call out to the data compiler uh, class to do the actual compile. And we'll go into that more later. Uh, so I showed briefly the thing called the compile environment. So the reason for for the compile environment to exist is again that we want these fast uh, compile times, and we're, when we're when we're running in asset server time in asset server mode, we we have a single executable running and we serve uh, serve multiple compile requests, and that actually turns out to be pretty important too, uh, just for getting fast compile times because booting up an executable takes quite some time. It has to load all its code into memory and so on. So if we had to reboot an executable for each compile, um, that would quickly destroy our goal of having interactive compile times. Uh, so we want it to be running uh, all the time. And also, there's a lot of this setup process that we did, like creating creating the file systems and and uh, doing these other kinds of setup, a lot of that setup also takes time. Uh, we don't want to do stuff like re-indexing the disks for each compile. Um, uh, basically anything, even even things like, you know, I talked about in, in a previous talk, I talked about these ID strings we have and that we have a strings text file that we generate. Uh, well, when we when we boot up a new compile, we need to read in the strings text files to know which strings we have already seen. Uh, so we know that those strings don't have to be recorded again. But reading in that file takes time. I mean, everything we do with disk where we read and parse files takes time. So we want to avoid all those time-consuming operations uh, as much as we can. And what is the solution to that? Well, the solution is to cache everything. So we only do these things once, and then we keep it uh, keep it in memory for the remainder. So when another compile request comes in, we already have the strings text file parsed. We already have the source cache set up. We already have everything that we need, so we can do the we can get down to these uh, really fast interactive compile times that we want. Uh, I put oh no here because. As, as I'm sure you know, caching is one of the really complicated things in uh, in computer science. One of the things that always uh, that you always mess tend to mess up because you cache something and then some precondition change to the cache is no longer valid. And making sure that caches are valid is a lot through through all hierarchies that you have in a computer is a lot of what makes computing complicated. But we kind of have to to get these these fast compile times. So um, we have a class called compile environment that does this. Um, so a compile environment, uh, the compile environment is just a struct for keeping track of all the things that we need in order to perform a compile. So it just gathers the, the things that we need. We need uh, the cache for the source data, Editor data, I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, we need a cache for the data that we are writing, uh, the, the end result folder that we're writing. It's a file system cache that I talked about before. Then we have some other stuff that I'll talk about later that also gets created. We have this ID string uh, repository that I mentioned. So all of these stuff are needed for, for the compile. As uh, so we gather them all in a struct that we can pass into the compiler, so it can has all the information it needs. And then we have this cache, compile environment cache, that is used for getting all this data. So it caches, it caches all these objects uh, based on based on the keys, uh, based on the individual keys necessary to access them. So. Uh, for example, we create the file system cache for each directory and cache it. So if we have, if we call this with the directory that we have already used, we get back uh, an already initialized file system cache object. If it's a new directory, then we have to create it, and so on for all these different types of 
objects that we that we have. Uh, so that just makes sure that we we can keep all the information that is the same between different runs of the compiler. Um, so this even works the way it's implemented now. It even works across projects. So it will cache it will cache the source directory for different projects, uh, and you can switch project, and all all the objects will still be remembered. That's that's perhaps a bit overly ambitious. You could say that well, it's it's acceptable to restart the data compiler when you switch project, then we can take this cost of of, um, of paying for restarting the executable and rescanning the disks and so on. Uh, because you don't switch projects that often, usually. You don't go back and forth um, uh, super much, um, unless you have like multiple unless you want to support like having multiple editors running and each editor and connected to a different project, then you, then you start uh, having to need that again. But yeah, so you could you could maybe say maybe we should make this simpler. Uh, maybe we should require a restart between projects, and we could make this cache a bit simpler. But on the other hand, the cache is up and working now, and so uh, maybe maybe it's better just to not touch it, and we'll have the the feature of being able to switch projects too without without paying a switching cost. Um, so there are multiple components or multiple classes that get involved whenever we want to do a data compile. And so I'll do a brief overview of them here and then we'll see them a little bit more in detail. We're going into each of them in a little more detail and talk about them. Um, there is the data compiler and that that's the class that sort of does the actual compile. It calls out to all these different compile callbacks. So that's like the main class. Um, we have something we saw called a source cache, um, which is which is essentially just a thin wrapper around the source database, the file system for the source database. It adds a little bit of functionality. It adds code for getting all the resources, um, uh, for getting a list of all the resources. And it also has the support for something we call file folders. And file folders are used, uh, it's basically only used by Scaleform right now, but it could be used for other things as well. The main idea behind it is that sometimes you don't want to compile a single file into a resource you might have a bunch of related files uh, that should compile into a single binary resource. Uh, so this allows the source resources to be folders instead of individual files. Uh, so we have a list in settings ini, you can create a list of which folder extensions should cause the folders to be treated as, as single resources. So usually it's just S2D, which is a scale form, uh, which is used for scale form. So if we have a folder with the extension S2D, all the folders in that will be comp all the files in that will be used to compile a single resource uh, that will be uh, the scale form resource. But you could you could use this system to add additional things. For example, if you wanted to have like web page support, you could have a you could have a folder with HTML files and CSS files and images and JavaScript files and all the files you need and you could compile that into a single uh, single binary resource that entire folder uh, but that's pretty much all it does it doesn't really do much this this class and we have the file system cache which I've talked about previously uh, which is used for the output data and it, it caches the write so that we don't have to wait for the disk to flush uh, we can write to the disk on a background thread, which increases our speed. Um, we have a class called the exploded database, and this class is used. This class is used to represent uh, the data folder. So, so when we compile, we have our source folder with all the source data, 
and then that get complied into a data folder for a, for a specific platform. And in this data folder, uh, we have lots of binary, binary files here, uh, which represents resources. So this exploded database, it knows how to um, it knows how to map a resource name into one of these uh, one of these files on disk that represents a compiled resource. So it knows how to find whenever the engine wants to load a specific resource, is sort of a database for for knowing how to find it. Its code it's called an exploded database uh, because it's all exploded out into individual files on the disk. It's kind of a weird name, but it's stuck with us from since the beginning. Um, there is a package includes database, which is used when we compile package files, and it tracks uh, which files should be dragged in by other files uh, when we add them to the package. And I'll talk more about this later. Um, there is an information database, uh, which can be used to used to store general metadata that we find during the compile of files and that we sort of want, want to keep around and, and query later. I'll talk about more about this too. And then there is also a shader cache database which keeps track of which shader permutations are in use and knows which permutations of shaders that we, that we need to compile. Uh, I won't be talking more about this since this is uh, render stuff and I'll only talk about the core code, but it's good to know that it is in there. Um, so, the data compiler code. Uh, the main code for the data compiler is not that complicated. What it does is that it first gets all the sources. Uh, all the sources that we have in the source folder. So just a big list of all of them. Um, then it needs to find out from these list of sources. And for the sources, we also have their, we also have their hash because the database actually keeps track of that. So from these sources, it, it finds out uh, which files we need to compile. And it can does that it, there can be like three things that can cause a file to to have to compile. It can either be that the source file for the resource has changed, and we track the hash for the files, and we know the hash, so we can know if the hash has changed. I, it used to say file size here. That's because it actually used to be file and size uh, or modified date and size that we tracked. But now we're actually we've actually switched to tra tracking the actual hashes of files which is better because then just changing the date won't trigger a recompile. Uh, so either it's because the source file has changed or it could be that the dependency has changed. Uh, so it could be that our file, during the file when we compile the unit, we read its physics file, for instance. So if the physics file has changed, we need to recompile the unit. Um, this is kept track of by the exploded database too, so it knows the, all the dependencies of all the files. So uh, it can, and, and the hashes that they were when we last compiled this file. So it, it can know if any of our dependencies has changed. And the third common case is if the binary format has changed, like if the version, if we've changed this version number that I talked about. Uh, then all the files of that type need to be recompiled to the new binary format. Um, there's actually another case which is uh, compiled resource doesn't exist. Of course, if 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 this if this resource has never been if this resource has never been compiled before, uh, then uh, the output resource doesn't exist, and we need to recompile it. Uh, so this also tells you what you need to do if you want to force a recompile of a file. You might be interested in doing that for debugging purposes. If you're if you're writing compiler code, um, data compiling code, and you're suspecting that you have some problems in your code, you might want to force a recompile. So the easiest way is to change the change the source file. Just put the number bunch of spaces in there 
if you change the hash and it will trigger trigger a recompile or you can up the up the version format uh, to trigger all of them to change or you can go into this file here compile versions in the in the compile data folder this file compile versions remembers all the versions that was used for the last uh, so I can drag this it, come on. <laughs> oh, I'm bad at dragging files. Ah, oh, let's just open it. Um, so, dun, 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 dun. so it keeps track of 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 the resource uh, of the version of the binary version that was used for the last compile. So if I don't want to, if I just want to recompile locally and don't want to force everybody, I don't, I haven't made an actually, I haven't actually changed the binary format. I'm just testing stuff on my computer. I can just reset the resource, uh, reset the version that it thinks it compiled at last time. So I can set this to zero and I will think it compiled flow at version zero. And since the current version is 109, it, it will recompile all the flow files locally. So that can be a useful way of triggering a recompile locally. Um, so we can look at the code here too. Yes, so you've seen it. Um, so here it gets a list of all the sources from the, from the compile environment and it sets up some of these some of these uh, compilers uh, then it runs runs this filter filter files it first checks these versions checks the versions of the binary formats then it runs a filter to get a list of all the files to compile uh, using those those tests that i talked about so then it knows all the things that needs to be compiled it then calls out to do the do the actual compile to all these callback functions, and we have an optimization to do that in parallel that you can disable if you if you think there is a threading issue if you want to test it single threaded. But normally it runs parallel, so it will compile all these things in parallel, and then it saves the results to the output directories and these different databases that we have. So yeah, saves the compiles and saves the result. So one in, in, important thing to notice is that um, something that differs our engine from 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 some other engines is that we don't have like this chain of dependencies like uh, in 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 some engines when you build a pipeline. Uh, you sort of you, you sort of have a chain of rules that defines how one thing gets compiled into another thing, and then one thing getting compiled can trigger another thing to get compiled, and so on. So in those systems, you might have you might modify a unit, and the unit is modified, and then you have a rule that says that well, when this unit is modified, this level needs to be modified. So you apply that rule, and then when the level is modified, maybe there is a light baking step that needs to run. So then um, then that in turn triggers another compile step that will run the light baker and will generate more modified files and then maybe some sort of package thing will run to package these files together into a zip file and so on so there can be a long chain of long chain of compiles triggering other compiles and we don't do that our our files are compiled individually so we know all the dependencies of a specific resource so we we Compiling other resources won't affect the compile of our resource and the way the reason why we've done that is again to improve our Well two reasons basically one. It's a bit simpler. It's a bit simpler to know what's going on rather than having to uh, Follow this whole long chain of compiles that you don't know how long it's going to go on where where it ends up But also it's good for performance because we know 
we know right away all the files that we need to compile and we can do it all in parallel. We don't have to wait for, for anything else to compile and so on. Um, the drawback is that it's sort of, we are sort of losing maybe some compile time optimizations that you could do. Like maybe, maybe you could sort of merge if, if you have this more complicated multiple chain compile step, you could find out things like, well, these two units are always used together. So I can in fact merge them into a single static unit and save some draw calls or, or do stuff like that. Uh, and those kind of optimizations we can't really do during the compile time. And also we don't really want to do them during the compile time because our goal is to have really fast interactive compile times. And if you start to do like crazy optimizations, like optimizations over the whole data of the entire project, then those optimizations will, will always be slow. So, so our take is rather to not do those optimizations during the compile time, but do everything that is expensive ahead of compile. So generating light maps, for example, baking light maps, we don't do that as part of the compile. That is an explicit step that you do in the in the editor. Like now I generate light map and now I generate navigation meshes and ev everything that is uh, expensive and takes a really long time to run. You do that ahead of time in, in the in the editor instead of it during during the compile. Um, so there's there's one ex there's one exception to this rule that everything is compiled immediately and doesn't depend on the compiler of other files, and that is the package files. So the package files actually depends on knowing what what other files are included, what files are included by other files. Uh, so when a level is included in a package, we need to include all the things that that level uses, all the units and stuff, and we don't know that until we compile the level. So we actually have a two-step process where first we compile everything else uh, individually and then we compile uh, the package files. So writing a data compiler. How do you go about if you want to add, add a new type uh, to the system, create a compiler for it, produce some binary data? It's pretty simple. You only have to implement uh, compile a function and register it uh, the way we registered in, in main data compiler. So we registered all these uh, compile functions for all these different types. And that's pretty much all you have to do. Uh, one of these compile functions takes its input a compile parameters object and produces a compile result object as output. So the compile result is kind of simple. So let's start with that. The compile result is just a struct with, with three things in it. Uh, there's an error, uh, which you use if, if your compile fails for some reason, you put an error message in, uh, in there, and it will be reported out. Uh, compiles, never, compiles never fail. We, we, we don't interrupt the compile in case of an error. Instead, we gather all the errors and we report them at the, at the end of the compile and you can choose to continue to you can choose to try to run even if the compile failed and it will use sort of missing resources uh, if a unit didn't compile you will get them it will use a, a default missing unit to represent that unit in the level instead so it's not terrible if it if it doesn't compile um, but in addition to this error message there's also uh, one buffer a buffer again is just a pointer and a length uh, so it's just a chunk of data. And this is the actual resource data. This is the data that will be written to disk and the data that will be loaded into memory uh, when you load the resource later. Uh, you can also write stream data. Uh, this is only used by very small number of resources. The stream data is data that you don't want in memory for this resource. Uh, you want it on disk so that you can stream it from disk uh, during during the runtime. So this is used by the sound system, for instance. Um, sound system, sounds typically, when you compile sounds, they typically write uh, the first few seconds or so of the sound in this resident, this memory resident segment, so that we can start playing the sound without having to go to disk. Uh, but then the bulk of the sound uh, is written as streaming data, so that 
so that it doesn't use um, as much memory. Instead, we are streaming from the disk when we play it back. Um, and of course, this is configurable. So for short sounds and sounds that are played a lot, you would you would probably put the whole sound in memory. While as for music and like ambient sounds and stuff like that, you you'll put it in the stream data. But most most compilers don't use the stream data at all. Um, then we have the compile parameters, which is kind of complicated beast because it contains all the information that anybody could ever need for compiling data, and which is kind of a lot. But mostly it has uh, it has functions. The, the most commonly used function is this read function, which will just read uh, the input data. So it reads the JSON file or the texture file or whatever it is you're compiling. And and then you can just do whatever processing you need to do from that source data to find out the binary data. Now, some, some um, compilers need to do more than that. They need to read additional files, and they can do that using these, this exist function and this read function to read additional parts from the disk. And yeah, I'll get to the other stuff here. It's not, not as important. There's also some query things you can do. You can query the destination platforms. You can switch on that and produce different different data for different platforms. Uh, so on. But that's that. Um, so let's look at an example. This is the font file. So it's pretty, that's a pretty straightforward file. Uh, let's see if I have uh, look at the header first. So in the in the compiled data, uh, we use we use structs like this to represent font glyphs with some information about uh, what they represent, uh, where they are in the texture map, some kerning information, and a font resource. Uh, in memory consists of a resource header, which has some information about the size, uh, uh, line height, and stuff like that. And then we have the number of glyphs and the number of kerning pairs. And then this is followed directly in memory by the glyph data. So all these strict structs are followed directly by it in memory. And then all the kerning pa pair data follow directly in memory. So we don't have any pointers in here. We don't do any pointer patching. When we want to get to the glyph data, I talked about this a bit in, in, in the last talk, but when we want to get to the glyph data, we can just step past the end of the font resource, take the memory pointer there, just cast it into a glyph array. Similarly, to get to the kerning pair data, we take the font resource, we, add, we tend to take the font resource pointer, we add the size of the font resource, we get to the glyph data, we add the size of the glyph struct times the number of glyphs, we get to the kerning pair data, can cast that to per kerning pair pointer, and then just use it. Some people get like uneasy by, by this amount of like casting and row pointer manipulation. But once you get sort of, I mean, it can be a bit uncomfortable at first. You're like just like casting row memory pointers left and forth, and oh my god, won't we create all kinds of errors and out of bounds things? And what if I what if I add one to the, what if I get the offset wrong, I will cast into some weird memory. Usually that's, I mean, usually that's not a big problem because if you if you get something wrong and, and, and you get a wrong pointer, you get a very obvious error. You get you get like a glyph pointer that po points to, that, to some memory that's just wrong, like the width is a billion or minus 200,000. You, you get very obvious errors and those obvious errors are really, really easy to find and really easy to correct in your code. So once you get used to using this for a while, I, I, I find that that sort of anxiety of dealing with raw memory and raw pointers sort of disappears because uh, it's not that tricky. And when you do make errors, those errors are really easy to find. It won't put you in really horrible or really dangerous situations. So, so if you do this for a long time, you might actually start to think, well, actually this is a lot easier than dealing with arrays of stuff where, where we have like 
pointers, hidden pointers behind the in the clause interface that you don't really know what they point to. Uh, and you might start liking this more. Uh, that's what, what I've done over the years. Uh, so, but I was going to show the compiling code. So the compiling code here is pretty simple. Here's the compile function. Um, and we read the data. This is just the read function that I talked about. So we read the input file. Uh, this is just a guard here because we used to have um, we used to have XML font files um, uh, instead of JSON font files. So this is just a guard to make sure that oh, hope nobody has sent in one of these old font files before we try to parse parse it as a JSON file. Uh, but then we just parse this file. And after we parsed it into a dynamic config value, uh, we just extract the information from it. So we extract the header information, like size, line height, baseline. All of this is just straight up from the JSON data. Uh, then we do the same. We pack that, pack that data to the binary blob that we're constructing. We do the same thing for the glyphs. Go through all the glyphs, parse them, parse them into the struct, pack the structs onto the stream, do the same thing for the kerning pairs, pack them onto the stream. Now we actually sort them here before we pack them onto the stream because we want them uh, we want them sorted, in, uh, sorted. And then we pack them, so we put them on, on an array temporarily just to be able to sort them before we pack them all on the stream. And then we're done. Um, so it's really pretty simple. So, um, the exploded database. The exploded database, as I said, it's the class that represents this, uh, this compiled data on disk. So all these, uh, all these structures here. Um, it's not that complicated. It's basically it just has. Uh, it has functionality later for opening, for getting to it. So it maps the resource type and resource name uh, to specific files like that uh, on the disk, these, these um, binary hex names here. And so it has functions for opening. You pass in the type and name and you get the uh, pointer to the, to the input buffer for that particular resource. You can read it into memory and it has a similar function for opening the stream resource if if this resource has a stream component you can call this open stream function and you get one of these future input archives that i talked about uh, so you can get it so you get it back immediately without stalling and you can uh, process it later so yeah that's basically basically it and there is also um, to create this exploded database, we have something called the exploded database builder. And the, it's stored in the same file just below here. And the exploded database builder, uh, it's the one that keeps track of the hashes of all the files and the dependencies of all the files. Uh, so it's the resource that you ask if if a resource needs to be compiled or not. So it has this needs, needs recompile function that you can call to see if something needs to be, needs to be recompiled. And uh, you, also, you also use this when you write the, write the output data for, for the files, the data compiler. After it's compiled, call the compile function, got a memory buffer with data. It uses this to write the, write the data out to the database. Uh, and here's a very a function with super many arguments for setting the dependencies. So this is used for, for the, the dependency tracking. So it sets all the files that were read when this file was compiled, uh, all the files that were missing, all the uh, hashes and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we'll look at this a bit more later. Uh, so yeah, it keeps track of the dependencies and knows the hashes and can answer if anything needs recompiled. So it's the needs recompile thing isn't isn't that 
complicated. Um, so basically, it just loops over all the dependencies and it compares, it hashes the version of all the dependencies. The, the version here is actually the hash uh, of the file, which we call it version in this code, but it's actually the hash of the content of the file. It hashes content of all the dependency files together and does some other stuff with globbing that I'm going to talk about. And it detects if, if the hash has changed, then, well, the dependencies has changed, so we need to recompile, and otherwise it's fine. Uh, so, tracking dependencies. So, a dependency occurs whenever a file Whenever a file, whenever we, during the compile of one file, we need to look at another file to know how to compile that file. So, uh, so whenever we read something other than our, than the source file, uh, we are actually dependent on that file. An example of this in the engine is um, the unit file, for example, reads the physics file. So the tree unit needs uh, reads the tree physics file. So it's dependent. If if the physics file changes for some reason, if somebody changes the physics, the unit will need to be recompiled. Now uh, you could argue that why do we have a separate physics file? Why don't we just push the put the physics data inside the unit file? And in fact, I think we should do that. It's mostly a legacy reasons that we have separate unit file and separate physics file and separate flow files for units. Uh, I think which it should just all go into the dot unit file. Uh, there's no point in having it in separate files. Uh, so that's one refactor to do, but it's just for legacy reasons. Uh, but right now it's it has a dependency on that file. There are other reasons for having dependencies too, like that maybe we need to look at another another actual resource. It's not just this Sort of artificial case when a resource has been split up into multiple files. There might be situations where resources actually depend on on other files, uh, like setting files and so on. So, uh, so we actually track these dependencies automatically, so you don't have to really think about it when you write your compiler. And the way we do it is that we have in this compile parameters, we have this uh, read function. So, uh, where you can read paths. And if you call this function to read a path, we will automatically register a dependency for that path. So, uh, that will be registered with this resource. And in the future, if that path would change, uh, a recompile would be triggered of our resource. Uh, so, we will automatically get uh, dependencies for all the files that we read. The same thing. The same thing happens with the exists function. Uh, so we, there is an exists function that we can call to check if a file exists. So we can, for example, check if a physics file exists for this particular unit. This will also register a dependency. It re registers sort of a, if the file doesn't exist, this will register a missing dependency. Uh, at, and what that dependency, that is essentially a dependency that says, we are dependent on this file missing. Because if this file is no longer missing, the result of our compile would be different. Because we probably has an, have an if statement that if this file exists, we do something. If it doesn't exist, we do something else. So if the file suddenly comes into existence, uh, we need to recompile so that we take the other path. So we register those two as sort of missing dependencies um, with the exploded database builder. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, dependencies, you don't really have to think about them. It all works automatically. As long as you don't do anything like, oh, I'll use the, I'll use the Windows SDK um, file reading functions. I'll bypass the ones in, in, in these forms. And of course, all bets are off. But as long as you use this thing, every, all dependencies are tracked automatically. You get automatic recompiles. So then we have a concept called package includes. And, and this is something really, really important because I know this is a point of confusion. I know it because I've confused myself a number of times 
uh, over these different concepts. So we have we have three different concepts uh, in the Enyan, which are very distinct and they mean different things, but they are kind of similar, uh, which means it's really easy to confuse them. So whenever you whenever you work with a data compiler and you start to think about dependencies or packaging clues uh, or any of that stuff, uh, just take a moment, sit down. Uh, remember these three different concepts and remember how they are different and uh, because otherwise you will most likely confuse yourself so the three different concepts dependencies that's what i talked about just a moment ago that's what used during a compile and it will trigger a recompile uh, that's, that's a resource that's used during the compile of another resource and if that resource is modified it will trigger a recompile so an example is the physics file. If the physics file is modified, we need to recompile the unit because the unit reads that file during its compile and it's dependent on that file. As I said, usually you don't have to think that much about dependencies because they are all tracked automatically. Unless there's a bug you need to fix, of course, and you need to think about it, but usually you can ignore it. Then there's package includes. So package includes, what that means is that when one file is mentioned in a package file, if you remember, package files are, are our units of loading resources. We load a package, specifies a number of resources, all those resources and all the resources they need will be brought in. So the package includes, tells what other resources a resource need in order to be instanced in the onion. So, if we go back to the example with the unit file and the physics file, that is not a pa package. That is not a package include, because there is no physics resource. We don't compile the .physics file into a separate physics resource. It gets compiled into the unit resource. So there is no physics resource to pull in. An example of a package include is, for example, a level. In a level file, you have a number of units. And when you, when you load the level, all these units need to appear in the level. So in order for the level to function correctly, all those units need to be loaded uh, when we load the level. So uh, the level needs all the units resources in order to be displayed correctly. Note that this is not a dependency. If a unit change, if a unit changes, we don't need to recompile the level because all we have in the level is uh, is a reference that says spawn the unit with this name that says spawn the tree unit and if the tree unit we don't care the level during the compile of the level we just compile that that unit name tree into a hash and we don't we don't care uh, we don't care what what's in the unit we just know we we want to spawn that unit so we don't have a dependency on the unit. If the tree unit changes, it doesn't matter. The level, the level doesn't need to be compiled. The level still refers to the same tree unit. Um, so that's the difference between package includes and dependencies. Then we have references. A reference occurs whenever one resource in the source of that resource mentions another resource. And that's because we refer to other resources by name. So in the level file, we will have somewhere in the level file, we'll have spawn this unit. And it, it says um, tree slash large or something like that. Now, if we rename or move that unit and want to keep that reference, so we, we don't want to break the reference, we want to keep the level referring to the same unit, the level file needs to be updated. So the level file will, in this case, need to be changed. Uh, the source of the level file would need to be changed to point to the new location of the unit. So references, typically references includes all the package includes because, um, because the package includes uh, for something to be included, for something to be included in another resource, it typically has to be named. So it is referenced somewhere in that resource. Uh, 
but the references can also include more stuff. They can include stuff that we are referencing, but that we not necessarily uh, want to pull in into that resource. So the reference is kind of a wider concept. Um, the references as a concept right now doesn't really exist on the Enion side. The Enion, the Enion doesn't really care about references. It only exists on the tool side. So the tool side has lots of code for looking at the source file, finding out all its references, so that, so that you're in the editor, you're able to move a resource and get all the references to that resource updated. So in the Enion right now, we don't really have to care about references, but it's important to know that and, and keep that in mind. Uh, uh, because what you do have to keep to, of is if you create a new resource and that resource uh, references other resources, then you need to update the editor code or tell, tell someone else to update the editor code so that it's aware of this reference so that it can track references properly and so that the references don't break whenever we rename or move something. Um, this whole system is, this whole setup with the references is kind of a, it's kind of a fragile and not very good system because um, it's kind of hard to remember that you need to update the editor here. Scanning the files for references is, is kind of a cost, costly operation that we need to do in the editor. And all this makes renaming and moving files uh, a bit fragile. So you could, you could argue that maybe we shouldn't use names for references at all. Maybe we should use IDs instead. And the file would always keep its ID and references would never break from moving files around on the disk. And it, that is nice that way, but it's, it's bad in other ways because um, if references break for some reason, if you delete the file and you only have an ID reference, that, then that ID doesn't tell you any information. In the case where we have names, you, you get an error that says like, oh, I can't find the unit um, tree. I can't find the large tree unit. And then you know, oh, I know what's wrong. I accidentally removed the large tree. However, if it's all IDs, then we'll get an error that's just uh, error. I can't find the ID, blah, 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 blah. And it's just a random hex number that doesn't mean anything to you. And you don't know what to do about that. And there are other issues. That's, this is a pretty big debate. There are other issues with IDs versus references. And um, I'm not going to go into it in, in, in greater detail because we could spend like hours discussing just that. But, but it's a debate. But, but one thing that I think we definitely want to move is that to move the reference tracking from the editor into the Enion code uh, so that we sort of have all these different concepts in the same place and you don't need to, you don't need to go remember to go into the editor and change something whenever you add a reference. So this is definitely something I think we should, should do uh, in the kind of near future. Uh, to make the Enion responsible for this rather than the editor. And then we can also do this reference tracking that we want to do. We can do this as, an, as a part of the normal compiler resources. We don't need a, a separate scanning step in the editor to find references. So um, to summarize this, uh, very important to know about these three uh, concepts that are very similar but very different at the same time. The problem is that Sometimes you will see the, re the, the term dependencies used to refer to all three of these. So someone will talk about the dependencies when they really mean uh, what we need to bring in, in into a package, or someone will talk about dependencies when, when they're really talking about files referencing other files. For example, in the tools, in the editor, that is called a dependency manager, uh, that view. Uh, while as we, in the end, in, we, when we talk about dependencies, we mean uh, these things that will trigger recompiles. So yeah, it's it's confusing, and if you get confused about this, you will get very confused. So just remember, whenever you whenever you walk into this territory, uh, refer back to this and and make sure that you have these three different concepts clear in your head. Uh, yeah, so package includes was what I, what was really what I was going to talk about. We have a function include in package uh, that we can call to create a package include. 
So that is here in the data compiled parameters too. Uh, yeah, we have an including package file uh, that will bring that specific file, register that as a package include. Um, so you call that whenever you need something to be dragged along into the package. Uh, and then there's a special class that actually keeps track of all of this. It's called the package includes database. And it, it stores the package includes for resources and then it can you can query it and find uh, get all the package includes back. Um, so compiling a package, I'm going to talk a little bit about that since it's an important special case. We're running a bit over time now, but I think it will be like 15 minutes more, so maybe something like that. So a package file is just a list of resources. Um, that should be loaded together. And when we load that, we want to load these resources and all, the, all of their dependencies. So if a unit is specified here, we want to know load the materials that are used by that unit, the textures that are used by those materials, and so on. Um, so uh, the way this is compiled is not super complicated. Uh, we take the original resources that are specified in this file. Uh, we add all the dependencies uh, and we do that recursively. So for example, a unit may depend on a material and then that material may depend on a texture and so on. So we need to follow those recursively to get all the dependencies and add those uh, to the list of resources we have. And then there are some modifiers too that you can specify in the package. Um, you can specify ignore includes, and that means that we shouldn't follow these, uh, these package includes. Here, I used the term dependencies. I just did it. Uh, you see how confusing it gets. <laughs> yeah, I've gone over the code base multiple times and make sure that, at least in the code base, we use consistent naming for these things. But it's easy to forget. So, so, um, so you can specify a flag that you want to ignore the includes and it said specify exactly what resources you want to load, which might be interesting if you're doing some very specialized things with these. There's also add packages and subtract packages that let you do like set operations on the packages. So you can say that this package should contain all the resources that listed here, plus all the resources from this other package uh, that I listed. Um, we'll, uh, see some reason for doing that later. There is also support for globbing here, uh, which is used here, it's used for the levels, for instance. This just say, well, we should bring, bring in all level resources under this folder. It's used for Lua here too. We should bring in all Lua resources in the Lua folder. Uh, so that's, globbing just exists to make the package files a bit easier to write. You could, argue should globbing exist is that a useful enough feature wouldn't it better to have a tool for editing these files rather than having the support uh, i'm not a huge fan of globbing i think it's something we might want to get rid of in a future refactor but it's there for now and uh, globbing is re resolved these globs are resolved by Again, another function in the data compiled parameter called globs that we call. We call that, we get a list back of all the resources that are matched by the glob. And in this case, we also create a glob dependency. And now you're starting to see why, why this registered dependency function had so many parameters because we have a lot of different kind of dependencies. So the glob dependency says that, well, I used a glob pattern here. So if what that glob pattern matches, either because a matching file, a currently matching file is added, or a, a file that was matching before has been removed, I need to be recompiled because now the, the result of my compile will change. So uh, we, we create and register a glob dependency like this in the, in the exploded database, and then we can change 
we can check these glob dependencies. Also, when we do the compile, we can check, oh, does this file have glob dependency or has, has, what, this has what this glob dependency matches changed because we have a list of uh, we have a list of all the resources we get that from the compile environment, all, all the things we're going to compile, so we can check that uh, and see uh, yeah, if we need to recompile. So another source of some confusion that I should just mention here is that you can specify package files in the package file. And that just means that, that means, that doesn't mean that all the resources of this package file are included in this package file. This just means that we have a reference to this package file so that we can, we can load that package file. So in your boot package, you would typically put in references to all the other package files so that you can access them and, and load their resources. Uh, so it's a distinction between add packages, which will bring in all those resources from the other package file into this package and just referencing the package, which you just need and able to, to load that package. Then we have a concept called overrides, which also, which also gets involved with the package compile. So in your settings any file, you can specify overrides for the data compiler. Uh, and the overrides look something like this. It's uh, it specifies suffixes and where those suffixes should apply, either for specific platforms or when specific flags are set. So what this means, what this means, for instance, is that whenever, if we are compiling for the platform Android and we encounter, we have a resource which has the same name as another resource, but it has .android added before the extension then that resource will replace um, the original resource. So this rule says if we're compiling for Android and we have these two files, uh, large.unit and large.android.unit, then if someone attempts to load this file, this file should be loaded instead. So this is a way of overriding resources to make like platform specific resources. So you can make an, if, if you have like a controller image, you can make it different for PS3 and Xbox 360 and so on. So you can make platform, platform specific resources, but it's not just for platforms. You can also use it with arbitrary flags. Uh, so you can use it for, uh, if you want to have like, um, you can have like a PG-13 version of your game, have like a PG-13 version, uh, PG-13 flag and a corresponding suffix and that loads like um, maybe uh, effects with, with no blood in them or um, uh, ragdolls that, that aren't quite as rag, raggedy or whatever. Uh, so, so it can be used as kind of a pretty flexible system that can be used for all kinds of resource overrides that you want to do. And these, these overrides are actually stored when we compile a package. So whenever we compile a package and that package includes this resource and this override is active because we're, we're uh, compiling for Android, we store, a little, we store a little reminder that this resource should override this resource. Um, so when a resource package is compiled, uh, it gets compiled to com gets compiled to a binary blob that looks like this. Uh, it has a flag to indicate whether a bundle should be generated for this package or not. I talk about that later. Then it's just a number of resources in the package, list of those resources, and a number of these overrides. And the resources and the overrides are defined in this file. So the resource, it's just resource ID, which is just an ID string 64. It's just a hash of the type, a hash of the name. That's what identifies a resource. So it's just a list of all those. And the over, override looks like this. It's a hash of the type of the resource, hash of the name. It's a hash of the resource that should override uh, this resource. So this, is, this would say like .android. Uh, 
uh, large.android. And then if, if, if this override was controlled by a flag, uh, this is the name of the flag. In this case, it's, it's controlled by the platform, so this override should, should always be active. Um, so, so if this flag is zero, this means that this override is always active. If it's non-zero, uh, if it's a hash, a string value, then this resource will, uh, will always be, then, then that override will only be active when that flag is active. And the flags can actually be set either statically at compile time or dynamically at runtime. So you can set flags. We use this for language localization too. And then it's kind of useful to do it dynamically. Then you can switch language without having to quit your program. You can just do it at runtime, switch language. Um, so, um, yes. And the actual override, the actual override doesn't really happen in the compiler or the package system. It happens at runtime by the resource loader. So the resource loader will make sure to, to load the right resource. Uh, the package compiler just have to take overrides into account when it figures out the dependencies. So if this override is in effect, then when we, well, I'm saying dependencies here again, but as you know, it's actually package includes. So <laughs> when figuring out the package includes, uh, the overrides need to be taken into account. So uh, if we're, if this override is in effect, and the level refers to this unit, we know that it will actually refer to this unit. So it's the package includes of this unit that matters and not the package includes of this unit. So, all right, three slides left. So sometimes we want to write additional information uh, in addition to compiling data. We might want to store some extra metadata either for caching or for the editor to use. Uh, so it's not part of the resource, it won't be used by the runtime, but it's some metadata that the editor needs in order to reason about this, this resource. And we have two ways of doing that that are also in these file data compiled parameters. Uh, we have an editor file system <clears throat> where the compiler can just write files using editor write or read files using editor read to store additional information. And we use this for FBX files because FBX files are kind of expensive to parse. Uh, so we don't want to parse um, we don't want to parse them every time. Uh, so instead, uh, we parse them once and we store store sort of an intermediate representation of the FBX file in this um, editor file system. It's also used by the shader compiler to save some meta information about shaders like what input parameters they have and so on in order so that the editor can can display a nice ui for the for the shader and, and show all these these fields that the shader have <clears throat> we also have an information database that you can use to store arbitrary key value information so you just store like under a name you put some json data this is currently not in use actually i was added quite recently. I don't, I'm sure we intended to use it for something, but it's currently not used for anything. Um, but it might be used to keep track of size of resources or whatever. Um, so final topic I'm going to talk a little about is bundling. So a bundle, a bundle is a collection of resources that we've put together for deployment. So when we when we work uh, when we work with a project and sort of work on developing that project, we have this exploded database structure where all the individual resources are compiled into individual files, and it's like a thousand files here with these uh, these weird names. Uh, but when we want to distribute something to the end user, we don't want to give them all this stuff. Like that's kind of kind of annoying having to deal with all this uh, all these files. Uh, so instead, we package it up into bundles. So this is what it looks like for final deployment. Um, you have uh, these bigger files. Uh, some of them, at least this one, 
this one is like 40 megabytes, this one is 50 megabytes, bigger files uh, that represents a collection of resources. And actually each of these each of these bundle files, so this, this corresponds to something that's called pack files. If you, if you played the uh, original id games like Doom and Quake, they were used to call pack files, just bundling a bunch of resources together. And actually these files correspond precisely to packages. So each one of these is all of, all of the resources from one particular package put together in a single file and sort of zipped together. And as you can see here, there's, there can also be a stream version. So, so this file, you see these two have the same name. So this one contains all the, all the package resources that should be loaded into memory and be resident. And this one contains all the streaming data from that package. And these other packages don't have any streaming data. It's, streaming data is kind of, kind of weird. So you can kind of figure it out that this package contains the sounds. Uh, so the anatomy of a bundle, bundle is pretty simple. Um, the layout of a disk is just uh, the version of the bundle resource so that we can recompile it if we can change the version of, of our bundle format. And then it's just the same resource as you get when you compile a package. So the regular package resource with all the uh, with all the, the names of all the resources and the names of all the overrides. And so it's essentially just the package plus the data for all those resources. So followed by this in, in memory is all the, all, the resource, all the resource data for these resources. So it's a type of resource, a name, whether it exists or not. Uh, Non-existing is, is used with, with, when you want a bundle to override another bundle. I, I'll get to that in, in another talk. Uh, but then a the offset into the stream bundles, you know, where the streaming data starts and then the size of the data, uh, the size of the streaming data and then the actual data itself. So it's pretty simple, simple layout. Uh, but then this is actually compressed too in order to minimize the size of it. So that's, that's the layout of it when it's uncompressed. But it's it's sadly compressed in 64k chunks. So every 64k of this data uh, gets run to a sadly compressor uh, into a smaller chunk, and this is actually all handled by a special special input and output buffer. Uh, you know, I talked about the buffer classes in the in the previous talk um, that they handle sort of I/O. And these are special special kinds of input and output buffers that will do the compression and the decompression behind the scene. So the bundle class doesn't really have to worry about this compression. It's all handled by this, this buffer class. To load a bundle, we just walk linearly over the bundle and load all the resources into memory as we encounter them. And that is also one other big reason for the bundle. So one, one reason is having la like a nicer disk lay layout. It's kind of nicer to have a few big files and a thousand small ones. But another big reason is that we can load them efficiently. So when we load a bundle, we just walk over it linearly in mem in, on the disk. We don't have to seek. We just read it from beginning to end uh, and load all the resources that we encounter. Uh, and this really speeds up loading times. Uh, Especially on like, um, especially on DVDs, uh, where moving the moving the read head is really expensive. Uh, more, uh, less so on hard drives, but still really a lot on on hard drives. Less so on SSDs, but it actually really speeds up things on SSDs as well because there's just there's just overhead in dealing with lots of files and and how they get segments allocated on the disk. Even, even we don't have a, a physical read head that we need to move on an SSD, there's still overhead. It's still, I think it's still like twice as fast or something like that to load from a bundle rather than, than loading, uh, loading from the explode database. It still makes a bit of sense. Now, um, an issue with bundles, an issue with bundles that can be a problem for projects and um, that you often run into is data duplication. 
So a bundle will contain all the resources that are found in a package. So if two packages include the same resource, uh, we will that same resource will be included in both bundles. So it will be duplicated on disk. And a typical example of that would be, say you have made a game where you have a package for each level. That's kind of a typical setup because each level has some specific resources that it, it wants loaded. So you create even individual packages for each level to manage to unload and to load and unload its resources. Now, if you have the same unit used in two different levels, that means that that unit will will appear in, in both levels. And if you have like something like a puzzle game where you have maybe 200 levels, uh, those numbers can really add up if you, if you start duplicating the same unit in, in 200 levels. Uh, note that this doesn't affect memory use because when we load stuff into memory, uh, we only load it once. We have reference counting on this stuff, but it still uses up disk space. Um, this doesn't really matter when, when it's distributed on a DVD because usually we don't care that much about disk space on the DVD. We care much more about seek times. But when we're talking about other media, this is less true, like on the hard drive or on your phone, you care more about how much space you're using, how much space your application is using. It's not like a DVD where if, as long as you don't run out of space on the DVD, the space is pretty much free. Uh, so on these media, you care, you care more about it. So uh, there are some strategies you can use in order to, to ameliorate this problem. For example, you can, you can create packets where you put shared resources. So for example, say you have a, a bunch of levels that all take place in the forest. You have like 50 forest levels. Then you can create a package to have all the forest units and you will just keep that package loaded. You will load that when you get to the first forest level and keep it loaded for all forest levels. And in the, you will still make individual level package for the individual forest levels, but in those individual package, you will use this subtract packages options that I showed. And that means that all the resources that are found in forest units will be removed from the level packages. So the level packages will just contain the resources you need in addition to these shared resources. So they will be a lot smaller. So you can do, you can do tricks like this in order to, to get the package size down. This will actually also improve loading times probably because we can keep the forest units loaded in memory and just unload and load the, the specific level packages, which will be much, much smaller. So you can do tricks like this, but it's kind of, <clears throat> it's a bit painful if you do have to do a lot of it and you need to figure out, oh, where are these resources used and which levels uh, are these used in? So you could consider whether, whether this should be changed because I said we're, we're living in a different world right now. Uh, when we did the, when we started BitSquid DVDs for a big deal, right now it's pretty much we're mostly into digital distribution. And of course, if you do digital distribution, the size of the size of your package matters a lot more because that's uh, that's the size that you will download. Uh, so we have digital distribution that makes the size matter more. And we also have SSDs, which makes the seek time matter less. So probably this should probably be changed at some time in the future. <clears throat> I don't think we should go all the way to the exploded database because I said that's that still loads that's like um, that's like half the speed to to load a project uh, compared to using uh, bundles even even on SSDs. But maybe we should use some sort of compromise where where bundles are mostly used, but we sort of auto detect shared resources somehow and move them out of the bundles. Something like that. I'm not 100% sure what the answer should be, but I'm thinking that maybe we need to, maybe we want to change how we do this or add some additional functionality for making it, uh, making it simpler. So that's all of this talk. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, it's not a very complicated one. So in some of the um, concepts and the various things you've talked 
about today, you mentioned that there's like the possibility to become confused. Do you think it's worth doing a renaming pass on some of these things, or not to try and clarify I, the various different? I mean, I've, I've I've done the renaming pass in the Endian already because previously it was it was even more confusing confusing because the package includes were called dependencies in the Endian in in several places. So the renaming pass in the Endian should be done. It's it's all called package includes in the end, so it's pretty clear, I think, right now. It's just in our heads that we get confused. Might uh, be worth not using the word dependency at all, just yeah. to avoid confusion. <laughs> it's kind of a loaded term by now. It could, yeah, that could be better. Maybe we should stop using that. Yeah, <clears throat> I have also a question. Uh, it's also about naming, maybe. Um, it's a word a resource. So it seems to me a resource uh, seems to be um, a name um, relative to the source directory, right? Uh, root directory, and that can be either uh, a source resource, I mean a JSON, a SDX, something like that, or a binary resource. And that often there is a one-to-one -one match, but not always, right? Yes, that's true. Um, okay. Usually, I think that when we're talking about a resource, we usually mean we usually mean the the runtime, sort of the compiled version of the resource. That's usually what we mean. But then, since there is a one-to-one -one correspondency between sort of the source files, uh, we we'll often refer to them at, as resources too. But that doesn't always make sense. For example, with these, uh, let me show an example here, like with the when we have, uh, so when we have the units, when we have the unit here, we have a bunch of files that gets compiled into the same. There's only one resource here, really. It's only the unit resource, uh, and the materials resource too. But these things, physics, flow editor, uh, BSI, these these all get compiled into the unit resource. So. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to say that this is a physics resource, really. Uh, uh, but it, but what, yeah. what would be the you know the preferred names? Because uh, you know sometimes in some documentation, some discussions can be a bit confusing. Yeah. To, uh, not knowing exactly what we're talking about. What would what would that be? You know, if we really have to choose a name for this source, a resource I, I would probably refer file. to these as just source files. Source files, okay. And say that source files get compiled into resources. But, okay, yeah, sounds good. You know, Thank you. To make the, well, in the situations where we need to make a clear distinction. Hmm. All right. Thank you. We'll have another session tomorrow at 9, because a bit early, because I have a, an appointment later. So see you then. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>